the deterioration of my handwriting. <laughs> I got a D in handwriting in the third grade. I'm an old man now. That failure continues to haunt me. I saved all the letters from girls who said they loved me. As I look back on them, I can tell the ones I liked by the handwriting alone. When that girl from Princeton Junction drew hearts to dot her eyes, I lost interest immediately. <laughs> I also hated her loopy cursive. Tiny, precise script in real ink on elegant paper gave me deep pleasure. Not scent, sealing wax, color, or watermark. As I became a man, I worked on improving my handwriting. Its sloppiness infuriated me. It was too revelatory. I stopped writing letters on pilfered bank deposit slips. I sprung for better pens. I adjusted my thinking to maximize the purity of my hand. The better my handwriting got, the straighter I stood. I filled a thousand avid notebooks. I took a mistress. My handwriting became my immaculate paramour. But recently, I've noticed I can no longer hold a pen with brash panache. My journals have become slapdash embarrassments. I open them to random ugliness. I don't have the solace of the integrity of the handwritten alphabet. Sterile email, emails and obvious fonts assail me. I don't fall in love anymore. I wish my hands could still carve the cuneiform of beauty on the waxy emptiness of thought. But all that's left me. What is left me? The precise boredom of processing processed keys. This poem is called, We Don't Need No Education. <laughs> <laughs> you were sitting with your vexed complexion, your door shoulders, your horse aloneness, in the front row of my English for unwed mothers class. And I hadn't yet read your essay on miscarriages of injustice, nor had you read Montaigne's that men are justly punished for being obstinate in the defense of a fort that is not in reason to be defended. And it wasn't yet Thursday, 2004, when we would be sitting on the curb in front of the sick communion cafe, where you were telling me the body is a tabernacle of bliss and blister. And the smile on my face was palpably inapt. And I blurted out, there's an ill energy that emanates from your precise heart that I find attractive. To which you replied, editing me with a surgeon's cruel disinterest. You mean I have an attractive ill energy? And I said, yes, that's what I mean. Though that wasn't at all what I meant. <laughs> And the sun was pursuing the moon in an ineffable dance of unlikelihood and redress. And you were wearing your father's shoes, though I remember thinking what large feet you had, learning later that that was unfair and untrue, learning later that your heart, like all hearts, was fuzzy, not precise, that your candor was a sham, that you were neither a mother nor unmarried, that my interest in you was usury, not interest at all, that I was a man not in full, but in foolishness, a false Montaigne whose chin beard, though elegant, was the merest bravado. Well, the city rises in me. Cities, cities, I have lived in cities, habitual, arrogant, cities circumscribed by cities on the alert for alacrity, filled with false vitality, rising revised out of history, burgeoning cities bloated with stoic pride, notorious for hope, filled with ethical travail. These cities, yes, but also cities reticent, inferential, embedded with dissuasion. A decade here, a decade there, to what end? Position. Man needs locus, not looseness in his life. What's a road? A swift excuse for a city at each end. What is not a city? Nothing. Socrates lived in a city. So did Meyer Lansky. The city rose against them. That's what cities do. They rise, sometimes in us, sometimes against us. The city rises in me. I hear its whisper. I ignore its war. This next one is called Four Noble Lies. When Carlotta left me, I cried into my soup. I shriveled into harsh mathematics. A decade later, I was living on Iowa Street with Karen. She had goldfish and good taste. 
I loved her for her fleshy neck. We drank sinewy dos equis and played mahjong. In March, I developed that cruel facial tick. That precipitated the divorce. At the thought of losing her, my heart contracted into a span. But I knew one day I'd replace her with a brutally neutered cat. That's what it's called, ribs. Ribs or ribs. Ribs, R-I-B-S. Man reached into the carcass of the Lord and tore Satan from the rib of God. The mountains of humility went silent. The rain of regency dried its eyes, and the clouds of unknowing began to know. Snow, masquerading as kindness, ballooned into bombast as the world washed its hands of worldliness. Then, indifference, stiff as a wombat penis, stirred and woke from the dream of sustaining penury. I am imbricated by the slabs of dead ideas. I am teased by vaults of no gold. Ghosts hold me to votes I disavow. There is a formidable hole in the latent sky. It takes all my strength not to worship it. Thank you.